Well, good morning, everybody. First of all, thank you for all of the uh, well wishes I saw in the comment section yesterday just about my back. I appreciate that. It was yesterday was a rough morning and it was quite distracting as I was trying to work just uh, kind of with these spasms of pain, but it's getting better. And uh, I, I just really appreciate uh, you all saying such nice things. Okay. To get us started today, I'm, I want to do something a little interesting at the beginning of this because I got asked an interesting question yesterday by um, a grower in the Midwest. And it was around the context of these kind of March snowstorms. Now, we're no stranger to March snowstorms. They, they happen. But the question was more about, are, is there any sort of um, seasonal shift? And what was specifically asked of me is, are there changes in December versus March? In other words, we always think of winter as December, January, February. This particular person said it feels like you know, that, that December has been getting more mild with time and that um, March, which we don't typically include in that December, January, February, winter, you know, time frame. He says, well, it feels like March is now becoming what well, we should say. Most of it's like a, a winter month. I thought it was a great question. I, I thought we'd try to answer it. But first, let's do a little bit of analysis on the snow. You've been staring at it for long enough. So we talked about the snow in the Northeast, heavy amounts here. Some places picking up well over 18 inches of snow. The storm system that uh, we're continuing to monitor this morning, which is still putting down snow on its backside. And we also have some icing issues in parts of Iowa and a little snow left over in Nebraska. Well, it put down widespread four to eight inches, a couple of pockets here picking up well over eight inches. And then this whole area in through here, kind of an eight to 12 band. This put down heavy snow in the on the front range of the Rockies and deep into the Rockies here and also in the Sierra Nevada. So this was a potent system that rolled through. And you know what I'm going to do. I want to look at the total you know, amount of water in this. So let's do that real quick because the snow water equivalent is what, I'm, what I care about, to be honest, because when this melts, we need to see what we gain out of it. And what we generally find is that there's, there's you know, approaching an inch, maybe a few places in here with a little bit more than an inch of liquid in that snow coming right off of this part of Iowa uh, into um, you know, Minnesota, Wisconsin, coming out of even parts of Nebraska getting into uh, the Dakotas. So it did it. I mean, th this is the beginning of, of kind of curing what was about a 60 day stretch for parts of the upper Midwest that were very dry. And that doesn't include what was dry back in last fall. I'm just talking about winter, you know, overall, but there it is again, winter. Well, what is winter anymore? So I, I thought we'd just take a look at a website. Okay. It's this one here. It's called climate at a glance. It's made by Noah. Uh, I'll link it at the bottom so you can come use it and play around with it. I find it to be fascinating, a great website that I, I use all the time. Now, what I've done is I've used the top menu bar to go to region and I've clicked on regional time series. You can do this by state, division, county, city, whatever you want, or the whole nation of the globe. But I want to do this by region because the grower I was talking to was in the central U.S. Now, what the question was specifically is, is there any sort of trend December versus March? Is December more like a fall month, which by the way, the first 21 days of December is technically in fall. And the first 21 days of March is technically in winter, right? If we think about astronomy, but um, let's do this. We're going to look at average temperature. We're going to use the month of December. I'm going to go back as far as we have data, uh, 1895 to, well, won't have this year in it, but to 2023. And we're going to look at the National Weather Service Central Region. Now, what I did also was I chose a base time period of a century. So when you see a flat line across it, that tells you the average, it's the whole century, 1901 to, to 2000. And I also decided to display a trend over it. And I displayed the trend uh, on a per decade basis, but I chose to start the trend on 1980. And you say, why? Well, that's when I was born. So I, that's, I just arbitrarily chose it. And you gotta be careful when you arbitrarily choose trends. So what do we end up getting? You click plot, you get this. So Central Region, National Weather Service, since when I was born, there is an upward trend in December temperatures. Now, just a word of caution. When we did this, remember that 2023's December was way up here, the, the warmest one on record, right? And um, I started it kind of in a few years following, like 1984 or 83, excuse me, was uh, you know extremely cold December. So the variability is high, but the question was, it just... Um, you know, perception is, are we warmer? Well, you know, you got to go back to winter 2022. Uh, that was a pretty cold one for the central US, but overall we found a lot lately of these warmer years. Uh, and that of course is what gives us that trend line going up. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip this over average temperature from December to March. And that's what we want to look at next. And as we scroll down to kind of see, this is interesting, right? The, the, the increases that we saw in temperatures in December are not necessarily matched with the March trend increase. In fact, it's almost negligible. I'm not negligible, but it's very slight comparatively uh, to the, what we saw in December. So um, that 
perception maybe is founded a bit in these longer term trends. We certainly have felt as though we're getting more of an extended fall into December and maybe a bit more of winter type weather through March. I don't know. You can go play around the website, look at your individual region. Uh, I think it's just a fascinating tool to kind of study these longer term trends. But I would encourage you to change up the time period over which you do your trends. And uh, just as a way of understanding that, we have to be super careful with giving that kind of information because you can cherry pick where your trend starts and ends and get your results you're looking for. Again, I told you I just arbitrarily chose it to be over my lifetime. And and that was why I did it. Please play around with the website. It might help answer some of these questions you've got because you've got other things you can plot, not just temperature, but all of these different indexes. Okay. So please, please, please play around with this. All right. With that kind of question, at least an answer provided uh, to you, plus a resource, let's get back into this past system. Um, I told you yesterday, I was very disappointed, not only in my forecasting of this system, but it may be in the way the models handled it. And you know that I rely heavily on the models. We we all do. Um, That's just the way modern meteorology works. But there has, I got asked a question last night by a a, a guy I work with named Tim Sickman. Brilliant. Absolutely enjoyed having a conversation with him as our whole team got together uh, with a nutrient. And he asked me about model biases. And brilliant question. And I said, yes, it feels as though for the last um, several weeks, months, in fact, that models have been biased too wet. About the only place they have not, in my opinion, has been down here in the south and southeast. That might be the one spot where I feel as though the models maybe have underpredicted precipitation. Uh, but overall, I've, I I have to agree with them. And I wish I had the, the code to uh, answer that question. I need to write it. But you know, look at this. I'm sorry I'm going on about this, but take a look at this stripe in here. That's a dry slot. And I got a lot of growers that watch my content right in here. I know you are. And you're looking at this going, how in the world did this system lay down this heavy stripe of precip that went right through here but miss me? You know, and we can walk through the characteristics of any individual uh, storm system, but the reality of it was is that this particular storm system did produce a dry slot that came from Texas and slid right through this part, almost to this corner of southwest uh, Wisconsin. You go on either side, there was heavier rain. It's going to continue to produce the rain to the east of this. But this is the kind of stuff that, you know, we, we looked at the model forecast. And, you know, when this system was originally forecast, it didn't see this, right? It fills that in. And that's one of the things that models tend to do. But outside of all of it, I can make a, a positive comment on this. And that was that there is places in through here in parts of Iowa, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Nebraska, South Dakota, that we know needed this rain. Same through parts of Kansas and some of this rain and snow. And it hit some of these areas that were still showing last fall's drought issues in the subsurface soil moisture. I've also, for the last couple of weeks, been asking growers, because I've been in Illinois for several events, I've been asking, um, you might have tile draining. And uh, I can tell you that our research farm does, but we spent three years reworking that ground to ensure that it drains well. I've not heard many other people across the Midwest tell me that they've recovered enough moisture to get tile draining consistently. So just another indicator that this subsurface soil moisture problem uh, that NASA models, that's what you're seeing here, it's a legitimate thing to think through. Um, now that, again, I'm just looking at that bullseye right into this area. So let's get into kind of a broader uh, perspective on all of this. Sun was trying to rise this morning here across the east, and there's that deep low that's just sitting and spinning off the east coast, um, and the big cyclones moving through. So let's go back and look at it. This is all infrared last night. Here we go. Now what's great is I can see that snow swath really well. A lot of snow here in parts of uh, southern Alberta, getting into Montana, and this stripe into North Dakota. But you can see now. Remember we talked about that little like V that was going to show up because of the inflection of the storm system. There we can see a big section of the Red River Valley missing out on this. But this storm system last night also produced um, some nasty storms that rolled through parts of the south. I remember yesterday we had an enhanced risk in this area. So uh, when we see that, and then this morning only a few reports of severe weather, two tornadoes and four wind reports. I don't want anybody to criticize the Storm Prediction Center and call this a bust. This was a very, very challenging forecast. And I think a lot of the uh, miss in it had to do with um, just the preceding conditions before the main event began. There was a lot of cloud cover, temperatures were cooler, and it it, um, just affects the way the atmosphere is able to produce those storms. Now today, the Storm Prediction Center still got its eye out right down here in parts of Alabama, Florida, and also here in Indiana, Ohio in Michigan. We're going to watch um, this system as it continues to progress through that area. 
We still have the wind, kind of a patchwork here of wind advisories. And even earlier this morning, about 545, still a blizzard warning on the back side of this system in Nebraska. And you can see the winter weather advisories and winter storm warnings that are still in parts of uh, Minnesota as the system goes on through. Now, we do have another system coming into the west. We talked about that, right? But we now know that the way the models are handling it is more of a north-south trajectory than a west to east, which means we're going to watch this hit California and stick around over California longer rather than ejecting across the United States. Uh, but I just want to make a comment on these winds before we get into this. The I walked... I got out this morning and the moon is pretty full. It may not be a full moon this morning, but I could see through some low level cloud to the moon when I was kind of letting the dog out early. And man, were these winds screaming. I don't know if any of you got a chance to see them. The low level cloud getting pushed there was impressive. So this is a potent system. It is going to be very turbulent. I imagine if you're flying in and around this area today. Uh, so just something to be aware of on, on how strong the winds are with this low as it curls up here, you know, over this part of Lake Superior. Okay, next system is there, but watch what it does here as I show you in a few minutes how it's going to sink to the south. We're going to go straight to the high res NAM and just pick this up about 6 a.m. and play forward. So strong winds on the back side of this system. We can see that right in through here is where we do have the risk of the strong to severe storms later tonight, this afternoon, and this evening, and also down here to the south. The rain begins to spread east. Cooler air comes in behind this system, and it pulls right through Ontario and heads up to the Hudson Bay. Now that front will clear the east coast by tomorrow night on Wednesday night around 10 o'clock and it'll hopefully get out. Actually, it's a little bit later. Oh, it stalls out. You notice, um, I was thinking the front was going to keep clearing, but just take a look. It appears that it does stall out delivering some heavy rains from the Carolinas, actually starting from Florida through the Carolinas and up toward the mid-Atlantic. And I'm, I'm sure you all saw this in the news this morning, but there was a cargo ship that collided with a bridge um, seems to be an, a power outage issue on the cargo ship. So I'm, I'm assuming it's an accident that knocked that bridge out. So it looks like some pretty adverse weather conditions as they're having to get out there and start the cleanup process of that. But uh, there we go. We finally get it cleared out here by some point on midday um, on, on Thursday. Now remember what follows it is going to be this bit of a, a blocked pattern. So let's go in and have a look at this. So upper level trough low, trough and ridge pattern, forgive me, there's the system finally exiting, but take a look right here. We're going to watch as this ridge pulls into this direction and the trough sneaks in underneath it. That's more of that north-south repositioning rather than a west to east. So we get all the way to Saturday uh, morning, and now the upper level lows just cut off here from the main flow sitting near California. So that we'll talk about what that means for several days in California. But the ridge in the middle part of the country, this is all going to help just um, deliver mild air back into this region and a highly amplified pattern you can just see the size of these waves as they're going across north america now as we get to easter sunday and then into that early week this is where we see another shot of some pretty cold air coming across the country so this would be monday into tuesday the colder air coming through while the west gets a little bit of a warm-up and then we get into wednesday thursday of that week and we watch that colder air get out now, there will be another warm-up for the south, the Midwest, up to the Great Lakes as we get to the end of the first week of April. You can see here that another trough dips in the west. But I'm curious if the model's persistence with dipping troughs in through here is a feedback with the snow extent and the colder conditions or if it's really going to manifest itself in that area. Because uh, we keep defaulting to this kind of look once we get out there past day 10. So we'll keep that in mind uh, just to make sure that we're not getting burned by the models here on seeing broader troughs, which could produce low pressure systems that roll through the country, or if this is really just a manifestation of the spring temperatures due to that snowpack. All right. So now that we've seen that, let's get in and just kind of do some model comparison and see what they're up to. This is the artificial intelligence forecast, and I just want to take note that now that we've gotten this system almost all the way out, we do see drier conditions coming here parts of the Canadian prairie, parts of the central and southern plains, but very wet in the southeast, wet up the east coast as we saw, and wet in the Ohio River Valley compared to average. And of course, with the low sinking here north to south, we're going to see quite a bit of moisture going into the west. Uh, another way to look at it is let's go to the operational run. This is not the artificial intelligence, but the dynamical model, and it is helping us better highlight uh, those areas again. So compared to average, you know, these are the wetter regions and these are the drier. All right, let's go right to the model comparison. I apologize again. I'm trying to figure this out, but the European model keeps losing its 90-hour forecast for me, and I don't know why, but I'll show you what I mean here in a moment. So here's the low curling out through the rest of the day today. 
draping that front, which now stalls here on Wednesday afternoon and evening. And that's where we could get some much heavier rain right along the coast. And then that pulls through. And then just take note, right? I guess it's the 96 hour forecast. I just lost it. So ignore that. Let's get back here. What we're going to watch by Saturday into Sunday is there's going to be a frontal boundary that stalls right through here while that upper level low moves north and south. So here it is sitting and spinning off the coast of California. It's a snowmaker in the Sierra Nevada, hence the winter storm watches that are already in place here and winter storm warnings and very wet conditions throughout the West, including Southern California. And that low just sits there and spins through Easter Sunday. And we get some moisture that rides along this frontal boundary uh, during that time frame. So where are we by, you know, Sunday night into early Monday morning? Well, there's a push through here on Monday morning, possibly some snow on the backside. Both models are resolving it and we'll watch to see how much in a few moments. But that was going to be system number four of all of the systems that I was telling you about last week. And now it's much, it's just a much less potent system because of the way the low moves north south over the west coast getting through this upcoming weekend. All right, so that system rolls through by next Tuesday, Wednesday, and we're going to stop it right there because there's a bit of a timing issue here between the uh, GFS and the European on the speed of it. Interestingly enough, the European's quicker with the progression than the GFS. So let's do a little comparison. We're going to start off after the next five days because we've got a pretty good handle on that. And I just want you to see what gets added after the next five days. So can you see right there, we'll start again. This is starting Saturday night. We see rain sitting on that frontal boundary, some isolated precip in other places. This is already going to be here from the system going through late this week. And we can see the Western US precip out of this. But uh, if we just kind of add this up and take it out a week exactly right there, we can compare it to the GFS at that same time frame, which is also seeing the precip sitting on this frontal boundary. Um, terms of model comparison, this again is where the European is wetter. This is where the GFS is wetter. So just take note that the GFS much wetter farther to the west here with the stalled out frontal boundary along the east coast. The Europeans wetter with the frontal boundary tucked in through here and they're kind of mixed with the low that's moving north south across the west coast. From there snowfall starting off day five so this is starting off Saturday evening and then playing where we could get some snow on that frontal boundary maybe in parts of South Dakota Nebraska coming out of Wyoming and it's also kind of there with the GFS as well. But with that cutoff low sitting and spinning, we do have the potential for another couple of feet of snow in the Sierra Nevada mountain, maybe bringing the, the 10 day total from this approaching four feet in this area. Good snows in the Rockies uh, as well. Okay, I wanna go and show you again, the same way I did yesterday, the 24 hour probability of getting an inch. So we can watch this kind of slide forward. So there goes the current system. And then we're going to watch as we get in toward this weekend. This is Saturday, so some snow's coming in through here. Good chance of some light snow. But then what I'm curious about is right here. This is Sunday the 31st getting into Monday. And so there is the chance on the northern side of that front to be bringing in some snow into this area early uh, in, in the first week of April. And as we play it forward, that spreads east. And then after that, we're going to watch more colder air dip into the west as we break out of, I think, the colder pattern as we get past the first week of April. Uh, on the total precipitation side of this, this is the chance of getting another inch out of the next uh, 10 days. So just take a close look at that probability of an inch of total uh, moisture out of the next 10 days. The week two forecasts, I finally the CPC kind of back down to the way that the European model was predicting before with a little bit of a drier signal in here, April 2nd through April 8th stays wet in the southeast and we'll have to see if the broader trough does come back and live in the west like the model suggested to keep this area cooler and snowier but um, overall that's your week two progress of, of uh, model maps here temperature side frost risk over the next seven days we'll just keep looking at this all the way through probably halfway through may before we get out of our frost risk and uh, we'll take a look at the temperatures here these are max temperatures so what I'm really interested in, and we know about this cold air today, tomorrow, sliding east. Watch the warm up already happening uh, in the, you know, coming off the Rocky Mountains, some downslope flow, but extending here, uh, you know, into this part of the Missouri Valley, Mississippi Valley. That's good Friday. This is that front that I keep mentioning here. And we're going to watch by Saturday, right in through there will be a pretty strong line where you get north of it, temperature is going to drop off relatively quickly, south of it really going to heat up. 
And uh, so this would be Saturday the 30th, getting into Sunday. The model's been pretty consistent with this. And then into Monday, there's the broader trough sitting in this area. But right in through here, we're going to watch for the heaviest precipitation to sit on that frontal boundary. Beyond that, this is the day 5 through 10 from the GFS. And this is the day 10 through 15 from the GFS. And yesterday, we're doing a bit of a comparison. Day 5 through 10, day 10 through 15. Because the European model at day 5 through 10, while that looks similar, okay, the day 10 through 15 changes a bit with the European model bringing some more mild air in place, especially, you know, in this eastern half of North America, tucking in the cooler weather, still in the west, whereas the um, GFS kind of pushes a little bit more of that cooler air in toward the south and east. So just a little bit of a difference in progression. So here's how we're going to wrap this up. I think so much of the way that April is going to transition, I can trace back to the movement of the MJO. And if the MJO does, in fact, go through null space and pops out here into phase four and five, that's going to skip the Indian Ocean. So that means we're going to get the influence of phase one now, but get into four or five once we get toward or after the first week uh, of April. So what does that mean? Well, this is what phase one tends to do. Sorry about that. Ah, there we go. We just tend to have the cooler risks in place, right? You can see there that neutral and so conditions, which is where I could make an argument we are now that we tend to have better chances of troughs of low pressure and colder weather. But if we get out of phase one and get over to phase four, well, we'd see a different pattern, right? There's this would, this would suggest more, more mild air and same thing for phase five. So the point behind this being that if we can get the MJO to transition plus just normal seasonal trends, I do expect that the European model probably has this right. This is April one through eight. As we play it forward, we start to see that by tax day and beyond, we just tend to break over most of the country into more mild conditions. Even the West, which had that really cold bias in it, is backing away. And I can't really make an argument that this is that cold. This is a degree off of average in Fahrenheit uh, even. So I think we do get past the first week of April and we start to make a break over toward more mild conditions. So what about that MJO transition do we need to watch elsewhere? Well, I'll take you quickly to South America because right now going into phase you know, eight and one is a good indicator of wet conditions here drier in Argentina. But as you notice, this is a five day sliding window getting into the first five days of April, which is here. That tends to go away and the wetter conditions tend to go back to Northeast Brazil and down here into Argentina and Paraguay. And that's where it tends to wanna to stay as we get out there through the first full week. So the question is, does this trend continue to kind of back off on the precipitation here going wetter in these areas? We've been discussing that for weeks now. Now, honestly, if this verifies, this is through April 8th, this is perfect rain for Safrina corn in these states. But the question is, what happens after this as we approach pollination and get into our grain fill? There's still the risk that it, uh, you know, that it, that it dries. So we'll keep an eye on it. That's all we have to say about it. I thought you'd like to see some international maps, just the whole world, because we have very wet weather in Australia, again, due to tropical systems. Very wet in China, just to take note. A bit drier in places around the Black Sea, but Eastern, or excuse me, Western Europe, quite unsettled, deep low pressure here, and, and strong systems rolling through. Um, on the temperature side of it, though, as this all occurs, take a look at the temperatures. It's very mild across the Black Sea region, across most of Asia, in fact. We're cooler under cloud cover, and now that we're in fall here in Australia, and uh, but coldest place compared to average in, in the northern hemisphere, got to be this parts of the you know, like Norway, Finland, and then across the the, the uh, Siberia, and then here. That's it. So I thought I'd like to see that quick international picture as I wrap this up. Appreciate your attention this morning. Uh, we'll pick it up again tomorrow. Thanks.